Human civilization has come a long way over the last two and a half thousand years. This ancient classical world must have been a very different place to our modern age. A time when life was much simpler. A time without the stresses of modern life in a world without computers and information technology. But we may soon have to change our idyllic view of the ancient world. Clues from the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea are set to reveal this was a world more advanced than we could ever have imagined. In ancient discoveries, we will travel back in time to discover the amazing ancient roots of technologies we like to think of as modern. New research is beginning to suggest that many of the inventions of the last 200 years may, in fact, have already been known to the ancient Greeks and Romans. Much of what we have recently discovered, we may, in fact, have just rediscovered. The Greeks and Romans were also intensely practical people. Many of the things which they devised, planned and invented preceded by 2,000 years, things that we like to think of as modern. This story of ancient achievement lies a mysterious and arcane machine, one so complex that many have refused to believe it could have been built by the ancient Greeks. Hidden for centuries beneath the Mediterranean Sea, encased in thick corrosion, it remained an enigma until 20th century science glimpsed inside. What they saw inside astonished them a mass of gears and cogs, a machine. But what was it for, and who had created it? For a hundred years, it has been a riddle which intrigued but baffled those who tried to understand the mysterious object known as the Antikythera mechanism. But now, finally, its story can be told. That story began just over 100 years ago, in the year 1900. It was early spring when Captain Condos and his crew of sponge divers found themselves sheltering from a storm miles off course by the little Greek island of Antikythera. As the weather cleared, the captain decided to make the most of his unplanned stop by diving in the deep, clear waters off the island. That's it. The water was deep, some 200 feet, but then the deep water was where the best sponges were found. But so far down, there was always the danger a diver might return to the surface with the notorious bends. Once in the water, the diver started his first descent. But what awaited him on the bottom were not sponges. As he looked around, he saw what appeared to be dead bodies scattered in all directions. Terrified, he quickly signaled to be pulled back to the boat. Some thought the diver mad. Perhaps he had the bends. But the truth was far, far stranger than that. 2,000 years ago, another ship had sailed these waters. On its way from Rhodes to deliver a precious cargo to a wealthy Roman citizen. Just like the sponge divers, this ship had also been caught in a storm. She too was driven far off course to the island of Antikythera. But this ship was not destined to survive. 
here she sank, and here she still lay. Captain Condor sent another diver to investigate the wild story of bodies. What had at first appeared to be dead bodies were in fact the most beautiful marble and bronze statues imaginable. The remnants of that ancient wreck. Along with the statues, other treasures such as decorated Greek vases and jewelry were winched to the surface. It was the find of the decade, perhaps the century, and the breathtaking statues made front page news. One of the most perfect bronzes recovered was named the Antikythera Youth. The piece was universally acknowledged as a work of genius. It had clearly belonged to a Roman of exquisite taste and fantastic wealth. A Roman destined for disappointment, as this cargo never arrived. Along with the youth, a find known as the Philosopher's Head were the highlights of the wreck. Two faces that had not been seen by the world for over 2,000 years. But the greatest work of genius from the wreck still lay unrecognized. This rusting lump of corrosion held the key to one of the greatest periods in human history, the Hellenistic period, and perhaps the greatest achievement of that time. Two and a half thousand years ago, the Mediterranean was a place where science, philosophy, and art flourished. The Greeks, known as Hellenes, were living in what many regard as a golden age. They had invented democracy, opened up the fields of mathematics and science, and introduced the world to philosophy. They were inquisitive and inventive, no different in many ways from us today. In trying to understand their world, they had created this strange machine. All their 21st century descendants had to do was work out what they had created it for. Part of that answer lay far from Antikythera in a London Museum display case. 20 years ago, Michael Wright curator of engineering at the Science Museum in London, came upon another mysterious ancient mechanical device. Although much less complex, there were similarities with the Antikythera mechanism. We call this the Byzantine sundial calendar. Uh, we think it dates from about 500 AD. It appears to be a sundial which is also a mechanical calendar. It shows the passing of days, indicated by the age of the moon within the month. The gear wheels look surprisingly modern. Complicated mathematics and a detailed knowledge of astronomy would have been necessary to create such an object. Michael Wright decided to build a model of the device to explore how it would have worked. The model shows the positions of the sun and moon within the zodiac at any given date, as well as the age of the moon. Here you have the letter giving the day, that's saying Alpha, A, that says day one of the month. And correspondingly, in the, uh, in the circular opening, you have the black disc showing that this is new moon. And if I click it forward day by day, that's beta, B, day two. Day three, day four, day five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 13, 14, well, 15, and there is the, the full moon, the shiny disk. The other dials show the moon and the sun going around the zodiac. This instrument is, is much more simple than the Antikythera mechanism, but uh, what's exciting about it is to have found another instrument 
uh, very obviously in the Hellenistic tradition because of the, the Greek lettering, uh, and uh, also having gear wheels. So now we have not just one mechanism that tells us uh, the Greeks had gears, we have two. We've doubled the evidence. Although similar, it is estimated that the sundial calendar only had eight gear wheels, where the Antikythera device had at least 29, allowing for much more complicated calculations. Could the Antikythera mechanism be a mechanical calendar as well, one many times more complicated than the Byzantine machine, yet over 600 years older? But in an age supposedly without machines and modern technology, who could have created such a device? They would have to have been an expert in both mathematics and engineering. A genius, centuries, perhaps even millennia ahead of their time. One man who fitted that description was Archimedes, the most respected mathematician and inventor of his age. Archimedes lived during the Hellenistic period in the Greek city-state of Syracuse on what is today Sicily, off the coast of Italy. During his lifetime, the Mediterranean was a turbulent, war-torn place. A world in which his talent for military invention was put to good use by both his fellow Greeks and the aggressive new power of Rome that was slowly spreading its tentacles across the Mediterranean. Today, he is perhaps best remembered for the revolutionary invention known as the Archimedean screw, used to move water or seeds uphill. But Archimedes was also fascinated by other difficult mechanical problems, such as how to accurately measure distances. The greatest challenge of all, however, was to solve the puzzle of what caused the rising and setting of the sun, the changing seasons, and the strange movement of the moon and planets. What, in short, were the mechanics of time? Many years earlier, Archimedes had traveled across the Mediterranean to the most important cultural center of the Hellenistic world, Alexandria. Egypt. Alexandria was the most sophisticated place on earth. Founded by Alexander the Great, it was now ruled by the descendants of one of his generals, Greek soldiers who had risen to become pharaohs. It was a unique place, the meeting point of the age-old civilizations of the Mediterranean, a city of Egyptians, Greeks, Romans and Persians. Here they combined the wisdom of the pharaohs with the brilliance of Greek philosophy to create the intellectual powerhouse of the ancient world. And it was here that the young Archimedes would be inspired by the work of a mechanical genius called Tisibius. He would have a simple but brilliant idea that would literally change time forever. Tisibius was fortunate to be born in Alexandria, the place where all the knowledge of the ancient classical world was held in one vast library. A place where the great thinkers of antiquity studied and where shelf upon shelf held the thousands of scrolls recording their work. The library was such a famous institution that people came here from all over the world to learn and invent. It was here that Tisibius's revolutionary invention was recorded. where the young Archimedes may first have read of his work. To 
Eusebius is a figure who is often forgotten in history, yet his work paved the way for a technical revolution, the measurement of time. Yet Eusebius came from humble beginnings. He was the son of a simple barber. As a young man, he had worked in his father's barber shop in Alexandria, inventing gadgets such as adjustable mirrors. And here he was surrounded by the constant dripping of water, which would inspire his great invention. Tosibius knew that for thousands of years the Egyptians had used ordinary water timers to mark the hours of the day. The famous Karnak water clock is one example. Despite the intricate hieroglyphics, strange symbols and images of gods and animals, it's a simple device, as this reproduction shows. It was filled to the top with water, and as it drained out through a spout at the bottom, the time could be read as the level dropped. Markings inside showed the passing hours, but these varied as the number of hours from sunrise to sunset varied from month to month. The clock allowed the ancient Egyptians to measure the passing of time during the day or night, but this was still only a timer, not a constant clock. In sophisticated ancient Greek society, the ability to tell the time accurately had become extremely important. Their society needed order and schedules, which meant they had to be able to tell the time accurately. Sundials could be used at certain times and can be seen on important surviving municipal buildings such as the Tower of the Winds in Athens. But when the sun went behind a cloud or night fell, how would they know what time it was then? The first Greek solution to this age-old dilemma was their own water timer called a klepsidra or water thief. The klepsidra was a very elegant device for measuring periods of time. You might, for example, want to give equal amounts of time to lawyers in a courtroom or speakers in a political assembly. It worked very simply. You filled a large vessel with water, and when you were ready to start timing, you simply took the bung out of the bottom, and the water ran slowly out of the vessel. Lawyers in minor legal cases may have been allowed the time it takes one clepsidra to empty to give their arguments. However, for a serious case like a murder, a whole row may have been needed to allow more time for evidence. But when all the water was gone, your time was up. It's the origin of the phrase, running out of time, as that is quite literally what happened. For breaks, or overnight, however, a bung could be put in, effectively pausing the session. The clepsidra had one significant limitation. It's a timer, not a clock. The problem is that when the vessel is full, the water gushes out the bottom. But as the water level drops, so the pressure reduces, finally to a dribble. The ancient Greeks made their clepsidra more and more ornate, but they still had the same problem. The fact the water ran more quickly at the beginning than at the end. They created graduated scales to compensate for this, but they could not make them run at a constant speed. Tisibius, however, saw the solution. He realized that if the vessel was always full, then the water pressure out would always be the same. If he could master that, he knew he could create an accurate device which would change the world. This then was the challenge he decided to set himself. Eusebius saw that the way to simplify the Egyptian clepsidra was not to utilize outflow of water, but to try and obtain a uniform inflow of water
Dr. Alan Mills, a research fellow from the University of Leicester, has used classical references to Tisibius' work to build a replica of one of his earliest water clocks. It's very sophisticated. It's one of these inventions that's easy once some genius has thought of it. The challenge was to keep the reservoir of the Clepsydra full at all times. And this is how Tisibius did it. Firstly, he added another water tank above the main reservoir. This poured water into the top faster than it could flow out, meaning the reservoir was always full. And any excess water could just run off into an overflow container. The water would always come out of the reservoir at the same speed. Now Tisibius just had to measure it. To do this, he decided to put another water tank under the constant outflow. In this container, he placed a float with a pointer on top and a scale next to it. When the level of the water rose, the pointer rose at a constant speed. It was a stroke of genius. Tisibius had created the world's first mechanical clock, thanks to the dripping water in a barber's shop. He had harnessed the power of water and, in the process, he had become the master of time. But measuring hours and minutes was only the start. What else could this unique water clock do? The answer to that was kept here in the great library of Alexandria. Anyone in the ancient world wanting to understand time could come here and read Tisibius' books, which described the wonderful machines he was now building and the whole new subject he had invented, hydraulics. Before long, his clocks were not just dripping taps, but ornate machines decorated with gilded figures of gods and animals. And their workings were yet more elaborate too. He devised a complex scale for the hours, shown here in white for the day and blue for the night. One cherub holds a vase from which drips the constant supply of water. Whilst another travels up the scale, holding the pointer that indicates the hour of the day or night. But that was only the start. to sound a whistle and make a model owl move. He had invented the world's first cuckoo clock. The increasingly complicated series of gear wheels also allowed the scale to rotate very slowly to indicate the days within each month of the year. This clock was also now a calendar. An automatic, day and night, month and year, cuckoo clock. Archimedes was clearly fascinated by Tisibius's creations. He studied his clocks and used his own genius for invention to continue the work. In an Arabic translation of Archimedes' work, dating back over a thousand years, we can see a tantalizing glimpse of his additions to a Tisibius water clock. This modern reconstruction shows Archimedes' elaborations to the Tisibius clock. He added a bird who dropped small stones onto a bell, making the clock chime on the hour. The woman is a gorgon with snakes for hair. 
When the bell chimes, you look up to see her eyes change color, indicating the time. This is the first automated chiming clock in history. One can only imagine the spectacle when Archimedes unveiled his daring design. In Greek mythology, anyone who looked into the eyes of the Gorgon would be turned to stone. But with Tisibius's help, Archimedes could be the man who dared to look into the face of the Gorgon. Alexandria today is a busy modern port. A new building now stands in place of the famous library. Tragically, the original library was burnt to the ground, and with it was lost nearly all the knowledge of the ancient world. Only a very few ancient texts remain which mention Tisibius's work. We may never know what else he invented, as not one single page of his own work survives. So much information has been lost that Tisibius has been largely forgotten. However, there is one legacy of his work, one clue, which is still standing. This unassuming tower, tucked away in a corner of Athens, is one of the best preserved buildings from antiquity. Its survival, almost untouched, is a miracle, and one due to the fact that for centuries it was believed to be the tomb of the philosophers Socrates and Plato. But this isn't a tomb. Carved on its eight faces are clues to its real use. On each side, a worn sculpture of each of the eight winds can still be seen, along with a sundial. It was actually built by an astronomer around 200 years after the death of Tisibius, but is a monument to his genius. This building, now known as the Tower of the Winds, was the public clock of ancient Athens. Inside this tower, there once stood a huge and complex water clock based on a Tisibius design. This clock was fed by a constant stream of water which ran from a spring on the Acropolis from which the whole population of Athens could tell the time. But this was more than just a clock or a calendar. Some believe this strange building housed a device that even charted the movements of the sun and moon in relation to the constellations of the zodiac. We know the Greeks were measuring hours, days and months during the time of Tisibius. Could it be that they had also started to look above and measure the heavens? One man believed the answer may lie in the cogs and wheels of the Antikythera mechanism. In 1951, an English physicist, Derek de Sola Price, decided to find out for himself and examine the mechanism in detail for the first time. De Sala Price travelled to Athens to look at the mechanism. The pieces had lain largely untouched since its discovery 50 years earlier. The device had disintegrated further, exposing pieces of the gears which he was able to study. He became determined to crack the secrets of the Antikythera mechanism. De Sala Price spent much of his time at the National Museum of Greece in Athens, probing the secrets of this ancient enigma. Something told him that these fragments were the real treasure from the Antikythera wreck. Using new developments in X-ray technology, he could now see what its discoverers 50 years before could not. 
Looking through the corrosion, he was amazed. A machine so complex, it could almost be modern. He had to know what it was for. His meticulous studies of the cogs, gear ratios and inscriptions gave him clues to the possible purpose of the mechanism. Remnants of a wooden box which held the device also had Greek writing on which gave further tantalizing hints. Using this information, de Sola Price developed a theory and put together a model of how he believed the Antikythera mechanism could have worked. He realized the mechanism was an extremely sophisticated device for calculating the relative movements of the sun and moon. It also seemed to show the days of the month as lunar phases. Sala Price had established its mechanical complexity and knew that the knowledge required to create such a machine was immense. He believed that at the front of the mechanism a bronze dial showed the date and positions of the sun and moon. A dial at the back would indicate the month, possible within a 12-month year. A further dial at the back seemed to show either a cycle of 47 months or four years. De Sola Price called the mechanism a calendar computer. For anyone in the ancient world, such a device would have been invaluable. To understand the movement of the sun and moon within the heavens was to look into the minds of the gods. Many believed then, as some do today, that the positions of the sun, moon and stars at the time of someone's birth may influence their later life. What complex horoscope software does today, the Antikythera mechanism may have done over two millennia earlier. To the priests and astrologers of the day, this extraordinary machine could have been a window on the gods. But where could such a device have come from? De Sala Price had an extraordinary theory. What if machines like the Antikythera mechanism were part of municipal clocks, powered by the very water clocks that Tisibius had invented? What if they were commonplace in the Hellenistic world? Was this the secret of the Tower of the Winds? Not just a sundial or even a clock, but an automatic model of the movements of the sun and moon within the universe. De Sala Price also suggested that building these machines was what had interested the great Archimedes. Perhaps the Antikythera mechanism was a later copy of one of Archimedes' machines. De Sala Price published his findings in 1974 in an article entitled Gears from the Greeks. The article generated a storm of international interest. In particular, one man was to read that article and to spend the next 30 years pondering on de Sala Price's theory. When Michael Wright from the Science Museum first read the paper, he was immediately fascinated by the notion that the ancient Greeks had complex engineering. Wright decided to go to Athens to examine and re-X-ray the mechanism for himself. We've got this view with several of the pieces put together and it helps me to build up a more complete picture of just how the gear wheels were arranged inside the box before it all fell apart. Although intrigued by de Sala Price's theory of the Antikythera mechanism, Wright believed there was more to the device than de Sala Price had realized. I went back and read uh, Gears from the Greeks again and started to find problems with uh, Price's account. That's when I resolved I really had to look at the thing for myself. 
But for Michael Wright to understand this strange device, he knew he needed to do more than just look at it. He needed to try to build one for himself. After de Sala Price's publication, many academics simply refused to admit that the mechanism could be so old. The complex gearing seemed too modern. How could ancient peoples have calculated and precisely cut the fine teeth on each wheel, they asked. Surely this was either a fake or a later machine that just happened to be lost on the site of the ancient wreck. So Wright set to work, determined to prove them wrong. Using only tools similar to those available in the ancient world and with the Greeks' knowledge of geometry, he set out to copy the elaborate gears in his workshop. Measuring and cutting gears with only a pair of compasses, a metal file and a good eye for detail was not going to be easy. But it was possible. After many hours of practice, Wright proved beyond doubt that with patience and skill, it could be done. You can't deny the evidence that the Antikythera mechanism exists. When you look at it closely, it's very accomplished work, both in design and in execution. Why shouldn't the ancient Greeks have done it? We know from translations of his work that Archimedes was familiar with these types of cogs, and now it was the study of these gears that was to help solve yet another mystery involving one of his other mechanical marvels, the mystery of the odometer. We all use odometers every time we get in a car. It's the device which measures the distance we've traveled. But remarkably, this device was in use long, long before cars and was crucial to the development of the Roman Empire. The odometer was said to have been invented by Archimedes whilst he was working for the Roman army. It had been decreed that every road should be marked each mile with a milestone. But Roman roads stretched hundreds of miles, so how could they be accurately measured? By creating a cart that could accurately calculate distance, Archimedes solved the problem and the milestones could be laid out. This accurate measurement of distance would prove crucial in planning troop movements, and that gave Rome the edge on her enemies. Archimedes had set the Romans on the path to empire, and started a train of events that would ironically lead to his own death. Today, the most famous of Roman roads, the Appian Way, is still marked in places by the milestones that Archimedes' machine laid out. But there is a problem with this apparently simple story. One that Professor André Sleswick from Groningen in Holland would eventually solve with the aid of the ghostly X-ray images of the Antikythera mechanism. As no originals survive, the only clues to how the odometer worked are a few faded drawings in a Renaissance book based on a description of an odometer by a Roman author called Vitruvius. The drawings look fine on paper. The problem is when you try to build them, they don't work. Even Leonardo da Vinci attempted it. These are his sketches of an odometer which he attempted but could not successfully build.
Professor Sleeswig started to make simple models to see if he could crack the odometer puzzle. Then he developed a quarter-sized model. And this was a model with a difference. Where even Leonardo had failed, Sleeswig's model worked. The mechanics are simple. As the wheels turn when the vehicle travels, a gear with a single tooth pushes round a huge gear with 400 teeth. Every time the large wheel turns once, a small stone would be automatically dropped into a box below the device. This allowed miles to be measured. After the First Punic War, by decision of the Senate of Rome, milestones had to be placed on all major roads. And that also gives us an idea who the inventor might have been, and in this case, Archimedes. So what was Sleswick's secret? The answer was in the shape of the teeth on the gears. Whilst Da Vinci and others had assumed they were square, Sleswick had seen the pointed teeth on X-rays of the Antikythera mechanism. Changing the shape of those teeth made all the difference. Archimedes' odometer, for so long thought of as just an impossible dream, was back and working just as the great man had intended. All thanks to that most mysterious of ancient objects. The Antikythera mechanism. Back in London, it was the mechanism's pointed teeth that Michael Wright had now successfully cut for his working model. Far more complex than the odometer, this would be the most complete model of the Antikythera mechanism ever built. As each gear slotted into place, it soon became clear De Sala Price may have got the details wrong, but his theory was right. The Antikythera mechanism was an automated calculating device perhaps even a type of computer. You could call this thing a, a computer in the sense that you uh, put in some data and it gives you out related data. An ancient computer is a difficult concept to imagine, yet in many ways that is exactly what the Antikythera mechanism is. It is astounding to compare it with a machine designed by Charles Babbage in the 1830s, which is often cited as the world's first computer, and the machine which led to our modern high-tech age. This was the first modern device which could make automatic calculations. The technology is startlingly similar to the Antikythera mechanism, yet there is 2,000 years difference between the two. Wright believes that the Antikythera mechanism was more complex than de Sala Price imagined and most importantly also showed the changing positions of the planets as well as the sun and the moon over time. In Wright's model of the mechanism, a knob is turned to set the days and months. Intricate gearing then moves a series of indicators which represent the sun, moon and planets. The knob could be turned every day so the position of the planets could be monitored throughout the year or it could be set to a specific date to show their positions at that time. It is, in effect, a mechanical model of the Greek universe. Today, astrologers need a complex computer program to carry out exactly the function of the Antikythera mechanism. So could this machine have been created by Archimedes himself? We know from ancient texts that he built planetaria, but could it be possible he designed this one? 
It's difficult to make a direct connection between the Antikythera mechanism and Archimedes. What we can say with certainty was the revolution that Archimedes pioneered in mathematics and geometry was necessary for those who then invented the Antikythera mechanism. Without Archimedes and his advances, it's difficult to think that the Antikythera mechanism could have been invented at all. Archimedes' own life was cut short before he could finish his revolutionary work on mathematics and mechanics. During the Roman sacking of his home city of Syracuse, it is said a Roman soldier was sent to find him and bring him back alive. When Archimedes refused to leave his work, the soldier became angry and killed him. It was an ironic end for a man who had done so much to make Rome such a formidable fighting force. His death marked the beginning of the end of the Hellenistic tradition of great invention and science. His work, however, was preserved, stored on the endless shelves of the great library of Alexandria, a treasure greater than any the Romans looted from Syracuse. But even that legacy was not to last. The library itself fell victim to war and destruction being burnt to the ground several times over the following 800 years. Eventually, most of the collection, including much of Archimedes' work, was lost or destroyed in the fires. If only the library had survived, we may have inherited the insights of such great thinkers. Without them, we have been forced to reinvent much that we are only now realizing was already known over 2,000 years ago. If we had not lost this ancient wisdom, how much more advanced might science and technology be today? And what else may still lie hidden or lost from that time? Without that sudden storm all those centuries ago, that ancient ship might not have foundered, taking her cargo of statues, pottery, and that incredible machine to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. If a group of sponge divers had not stumbled upon the wreck 2,000 years later, the Antikythera mechanism might be lying there today, slowly corroding. What other technological marvels from that time might still be awaiting discovery? I think that uh, these mentions we have in the literature and this one instrument are just the tips of icebergs showing that there was a great deal more to this tradition that, uh, that, uh, that we haven't heard about. 2,000 years ago, there was a world more advanced than we had dared to believe, and more secrets may still lie waiting to be discovered. Ancient discoveries we are only just beginning to understand. The series continues.